He was just the best looking thing I had ever seen in my life. He reached through the crowd and grabbed me by the arm. So he wanted to know, where did I learn how to kiss? I said, I think I'm learning right here from you. My first met Elvis was in the eighth grade. It was Christmas time, and he asked the teacher, uh, the music teacher, if he could bring his guitar to class and sing, and she said, sure. He got up and sang, and, and I couldn't believe it because that wasn't the thing to do at that time. In high school, Elvis was kind of a shy guy, but the thing that really made Elvis stand out is the way he dressed. His pants and his jackets, they're all kinds of different colors. He had, it was either black pants with white strap, or maybe a black bear pants with a pink stripe down the side. Or pink slacks with black. Uh, a sport coat with a maybe trimmed in white with a collar turned up. For sure he had on a uh, kind of see-through lace shirt with his hair all slick back. You, know. you could miss him. Well, on the streets, out in public, I like real conservative clothes. Something's not too flashy. But on stage, I like them as flashy as you can get them. Yeah because uh, on stage your clothes play, play a very important part. Wherever Elvis went, there were riots. Uh, young girls were trying to tear him to pieces. It was out front, in front of the stage, where all the chaos was. Elvis would create it by his movements on stage and his interplay with the audience and all. By 1955, a 20-year-old singer named Elvis Presley is hot in the Deep South. Elvis and his backup band play countless one-nighters promoting their regional hits in places like Abilene, Texas, Leachville, Arkansas, and the Shreveport, Louisiana Hayride. They were splitting the money. Scotty, Bill, and Elvis. They were, he was getting 50, and they were splitting 50, which was 25 apiece. They were booking like $100 a day, $150 a day. Well, then they had to pay me, and the car expenses, and the hotels, and all that out of theirs. And we were driving all over to get that little money. It's good, the people like it. As far as rock and roll goes, I really like it. I enjoy doing it, and, and uh, the people have really accepted it great, and it just makes me want to uh, knock myself out to keep giving them something to enjoy. On June 27th, Elvis arrives in the Gulf Coast city of Biloxi, Mississippi, for three performances. In the audience the first night is 17-year-old Glenda Manduffy. The next day, Glenda calls her best friend June Winico. Glenda is going to see Elvis again, and she wants June to come with her. I didn't even know who Elvis Presley was, and uh, she called me, that, he, and he was appearing at the um, Airmen's Club at Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. So um, she called. I already had a date. She said, I'll help cancel your date. He was just the best-looking thing I had ever seen in my life. He really was. And so uh, he took a break from playing, he only knew about, what, seven or eight songs. Glenda, my girlfriend, said, um, let's go over and talk to him. And I said, no, you can go over and talk to him if you want to, Glenda, I'm not gonna go talk to him. And she says, well, let's go to the ladies' room. And so we had to pass right by office. And she said, on the way back, let's stop and talk to him. And I don't know why I was playing hard to get or whatever, because we had made eye contact a few times while he was singing. And um, as we were passing by, he reached through the crowd and grabbed me by the arm. And he said, where are you going? You're not leaving, are you? And I said, no, I'm going back to my table. And um, uh, <laughs> I was really nervous then. He said, well, uh, when I get through playing, um, how about you stick around for a little while and show me the town? And I said, Biloxi's a real small town. There's nothing to see in Biloxi. And he says, well, show me what there is. We're both looking out at the water and, and the moon, and he's kissing me on the back of my neck. And then he turned me to face him, and he said, why are you trembling? Silly question. <laughs> I was trembling with excitement, you know. 
and I didn't even kiss anyone on the first date. But he was a marvelous kisser. Elvis had real soft, full lips. June gets home at dawn after a night of kissing and talking. She's never been out that late before. As she falls asleep, she wonders if she'll ever see Elvis Presley again. It's May 1956. June is working as a car hop and in a beauty salon. Her one night with Elvis is just a fading memory. She can't miss the fact, however, that the handsome singer she met at the airbase just a year before is now quite famous. He has the number one record in the country and best-selling album. He's already made several network television appearances and even landed a movie deal. June and her friend Marie are on the way to Memphis for a vacation with three other girlfriends. When they arrive, Marie's first priority is to find Elvis's new house. I wanted to go to Florida, she wanted to go to Memphis. I didn't really know that the reason she wanted to go to Memphis was because Elvis lived in Memphis. So as soon as we got to Memphis, um, we went to down in the area where Elvis used to buy his clothes at um, Lansky Brothers, I think is the name of the store. And Marie asked one of the salesmen there what was Elvis's address. He gave her directions and he said, I'm sure Elvis wouldn't mind you going by to see his house because he's not in town. Elvis had recently moved himself and his parents into their first real home in a middle-class Memphis neighborhood. So we drove over to Audubon Drive, parked out in the front, and um, there was heavy-duty construction equipment parked in the backyard. And we figured he was having a pool put in. And we're still sitting in Marie's car. There's five of us girls that went. And we're debating on what kind of swimming pool he's going to have put in. Guitar shaped, whatever, you know. So I said, well, I'm going to go take a look. So I got out. The rest of the girls followed. And we're up just, you know, bigger than life, trespassing on Elvis's property. And I jumped up and was looking over the, over the fence top like this, you know, looking at the pool. And it's a square pool. <laughs> And the pink Cadillac drives in the driveway. And it was Elvis and his mother and father. Elvis's cousin had drowned, and Elvis was called home for the funeral. And he walks straight up to the fence and picks me up by the waist and puts me on the ground. He said, what are you doing here, June? And I said, I'm on vacation with the girls, you know. And he, tr he had tried to call me when he came back to Biloxi, and I was never home. He wanted to know where we, we were going and did we have any plans, and we told him that we were going to see a movie that night. And uh, my friend had a hot pink Ford Fairlane car. You couldn't miss it. He found the hot pink car parked at the theater and came on in and, and sat next to me and held my hand throughout the movie, and I thought that was really sweet, you know. Elvis asks June to go for a motorcycle ride the next morning. My first motorcycle ride with Elvis was on Mud Island. And he took me there because so he could open up the bike. He said, pull your hat down real tight so it don't blow off. And we were just really moving out. And I was just beside myself with excitement more so than fear. And when we stopped, he was breathing heavy <laughs> with fear <laughs> as, as opposed to excitement, you know. When I think about it now, it was, that was an insane thing to do, just totally insane. June sees Elvis every day that week. They quickly discover they love each other's company. At the fairgrounds, Elvis wins a giant panda bear for June, which she promptly names Pelvis. He shows her around Memphis. They swing past Sun Records, the Memphis courts where his family once lived, and Hume's High. They visit Dewey Phillips, the first DJ to play Elvis on the radio. Elvis brings June home to meet his parents. They listen to blues records. Gladys Presley shows June how Elvis likes his fried chicken prepared. Elvis gets a long distance call and asks June if she'd like to fly to Houston with him to pick up his new Cadillac. Gladys asks June how old she is. She doesn't want her son traveling with an underage girl. 18, June replies. It's June's first airplane ride. It's also her first night away from home with a boyfriend. Although booked in separate hotel rooms, they sleep in each other's arms. 
There was something about being with Elvis. I just trusted him that he would never do anything to hurt me or anything. The next day, Elvis and June drive the new El Dorado back to Memphis, top down. After seven days of being in Memphis, we drove back to Biloxi. The town, the city of Biloxi knew that I had had this long date in Memphis with Elvis. The Daily Newspaper, the Daily Herald, did an interview with me after we went to Memphis. Total strangers wanted to rip my eyes out. You know, you think you're really something, and you're not. You know, you're trash and all this kind of stuff. And, but you just overlook stuff like that. Elvis had said that he had a vacation coming up and he was gonna come and spend it in Biloxi. And so sure enough, the first part of June, Elvis arrived in Biloxi. We had stayed in touch by phone and I didn't really know when he was coming in. And he told my mother, he said, well tell June I'm sorry I missed her, but I'm on my way to Florida where I can get some peace and quiet. So me and my girlfriend jump in her car parked on a hillside that we could see all the traffic leaving Biloxi, so I could stop him. <laughs> we sat there for a good two hours, no sign of Elvis. So when I get back home again, my mother is just frantic. She said, Elvis has called here half a dozen times, wanting to know where you are. And I said, well, I've been trying to stop him from leaving town. <laughs> Elvis tells the press he's heading for Florida, but his plan is to stay in Biloxi and spend time with June. Still, he can't get away from fans or reporters. That evening, Elvis and June are reunited at Coco's restaurant. Over dinner, Elvis relates his dilemma to June's mother's boyfriend, Eddie Bellman. Well, when I first met him, he had to leave the motel down here in Biloxi because of the fact that people found out he was, he was there and they kept coming by and banging on his door and everything. He was registered at the Sun and Sand Hotel under the name of Arthur Hooten, one of his buddy's names. That's a real name, Arthur Hooten. Rarely traveling alone, Elvis has come to Biloxi with Arthur, whose mother once worked with Elvis's mom. Red West, who it's said became Elvis's friend because he once stopped high school football players from giving Elvis a haircut in the locker room. And Elvis's cousin, Gene Smith, who seems to just go where Elvis goes. So I said, Elvis, I got a couple of houses, and I said, I can let you have one of them. If you and your friends want to stay there, you can come to the house and stay. I said, it's already furnished and all. And he said, I think that would be nice. And I took him in my car so people wouldn't recognize that Cadillac of his. Meanwhile, the press and the general public and everyone had figured out that he was there. The first thing you know, the crowd was all around the house aggravating him. Come on out, Elvis, and give, give us your signature. Come on out and sing for us. He had no privacy there. He was trying to get a little rest and take a nap, and he just couldn't. He, so he said, Eddie, he said, I guess I'm going to have to go somewhere else. He rented a family-owned house, the Hack, H-A-C-K. So he, he leased the house for the summer, the Hack house. The luxury home is located a few miles outside of Biloxi in an upscale resort complex known as the Gulf Hills Dude Ranch. Um, the, the reason Elvis had so much privacy in Gulf Hills was because it was so easy to get lost and his house was out of the way. And that's where we would come and go from. Well, the rest of June and July. On July 1st, 1956, Elvis appears live on the Steve Allen Show. On the 4th, his concert in Memphis draws 13,000. The following Monday, Elvis is back in Biloxi, looking forward to spending a three-week vacation with June. At Gulf Hills, Elvis and his entourage are away from fans and the press. June asks her friends Pat and Buddy, both crazy about Elvis, to join the group. In the evening, they all sing songs in the hotel lounge. They smoke tiny cigars and use them to set off fireworks at the resort's golf course. This results in a polite letter from the hotel manager pointing out it would be safer to explode fireworks on the beach. Despite Elvis and June's seclusion at Gulf Hills, the word gets out. Newspapers and magazines from all over the country are calling for an interview with Elvis's teenage girlfriend. 
The most asked question that I've ever been asked was Elvis a good kisser? And the second most asked question was, did you go to bed with him? <laughs> I didn't answer that one. <laughs> When a New Orleans radio station broadcasts news of Elvis's engagement to June, Elvis fears his manager, Colonel Tom Parker, might hear the story. The colonel would always kind of say, Elvis, you know, be careful because, you know, those girls may drop you if you get involved or you get married or something. Elvis accepted Colonel's advice, which was very wise of Elvis. Colonel Parker really created Elvis. When you say what was his role, his role was to create an Elvis Presley. For one thing, he was a fantastic businessman. And he always used to say, I have only one artist, and that one artist is Elvis. Elvis and June race 90 miles to the Louisiana radio station. He tells listeners he's serious about his career and not about to wed. Uh, well, I'm going to approach you with a question. When you do get married, what kind of a girl do you want? Uh, a blonde, a brunette, or a redhead? I've got a dream girl in my mind. Although Elvis is playing it cool, June's mother still has a good feeling about the young star. I liked him right off the, right off the start. I, I liked Elvis because he, was, uh, he wasn't uh, uh, loud. He didn't use any foul language. And uh, he was just a, a fine, well-cut man. June's mother's boyfriend, Eddie Bellman, feels the same way. Eddie had not really kept up with uh, Elvis's career or anything like that. He liked him as a young man because he respected his mother and father. He, everything he said was yes sir and no ma'am and thank you and please. And he was a real, just a real southern gentleman. And Eddie admired that. So he thought he would arrange a deep sea fishing trip. He had a friend that had a charter boat that was the first trip he'd ever been on as far as deep sea fishing or any kind of fishing. So Elvis enjoyed it so much. On the way back to Biloxi, Elvis asked if I could arrange to get the boat again because he wanted to invite his mother and father down to go with us. He called them long distance. We were all in the room with him. And uh, he said, I want y'all to come down Saturday morning and go fishing. His mother and father came down the next day, and I met him. We met the mother and the daddy, Mr. and Ms. Presley, on a Friday night. And they didn't know how to get to Gulf Hills. So I said, I'm June's mother. This is Mr. Bellman, and y'all follow us, and we'll take you to Elvis. Who else has a pink Cadillac but the Presleys? It's Friday the 13th, the day RCA releases Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. By the end of Elvis's vacation in Biloxi, the record will sell one million copies. The following day, we went fishing again. And his mother and father fished, Elvis fished, all his friends fished, June fished, everybody fished. I didn't fish, I was busy taking film, taking footage with my little eight millimeter camera. <laughs> I asked Elvis, would he mind? He said, no, you take all you want. Elvis was reeling in sharks and everything else, you know, and it, it was something new to him. We just killed the fish that day, just had them strung up like you just wouldn't believe. But I think Mrs. Presley brought a jar of peanut butter. She brought bananas too. Somehow during the day, she managed to make him a peanut butter and banana sandwich, which we all came to call uh, an Elvis Presley sandwich. His mother was looking after Elvis like he was a young child, and she kept bringing him peanut butter sandwiches while he was fishing. And she was handing it to him and feeding him while he was fishing, and that's a fact. I, it's on the film, all that's on the film. Before he started eating, she was holding it for him to, to take bites, evidently. She wasn't feeding him fast enough or something, so she, he took it and was eating it. Fishy hands and everything. I brought a bunch of German officers' caps back from Germany with me during World War II. And I gave them to Elvis and all his friends. And Eddie, knowing that we should have had hats on to be out in the hot sun that length of time, brought those hats for us to put on to fish to keep the sun out of our faces. They put on the caps and they started singing on the boat here. I think they sang Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel and that's two I remember. That stick is a boom on top of the boat. 
and it looked like a giant uh, microphone. He was just standing up there and he saw this big thing and he went behind it and started pretending he was singing to this tall microphone. And it wasn't, it was just the boom on the boat. It was funny. Elvis was funny. Elvis and June don't care much about their lack of privacy. Could life get any better? Before we got back into Biloxi, a boat approaches us and we're on our way in. So our captain slows for this boat to come alongside and two reporters jump on the boat. So this kind of ticked Elvis off pretty good. So in the film footage, you will see that Elvis is sitting up on the bow of the boat. I reach over and adjust his belt because his name is crooked on it. But the reason we were up on the front of the boat is because Elvis had put a friend here on this walkway area, another friend on this walkway area, to block the reporters from getting to him. As the boat nears land, hundreds of fans and press are waiting at the marina. The captain decides he better dock further down shore, but not before a photographer captures this portrait of the weary fishing party. I asked Elvis, would he mind making a five-minute appearance at my shoe department? I had a lady's shoe department and a, and a lady's wear store. I had a leased shoe department. And he said, sure, Eddie, I'll be glad to come by. So people started pouring in down here from all directions. Uh, they had the whole police department out there directing traffic, and they had to let them in and shift. And they liked to tow the man's store up, but he didn't mind that. He got so much good publicity, he didn't mind that at all. The man that owned the store that I leased the department from, he said, let's give Elvis a present. I said, that's not necessary. I said, he's doing this because I took him on a couple of fishing trips. And I said, he's not expecting it. He said, let's give him something anyway. I said, well, if you want to give him something, I said, let's give him a shotgun. So I went up to a sporting goods store. I got a 410 gauge Winchester pump, fine little gun. And we presented that to Elvis, and boy, he was just as happy as a child eating ice cream, you know. I brought some skeet targets out to uh, Gulf Hills, and he did pretty good. He missed a few, but he hit, he hit a little more than he missed. And he let his friends shoot and all that. We just had a ball. That somebody brought a BB gun up there. And everybody started shooting a BB gun and he held a cigarette paper in his hand like that to let somebody with the BB gun to shoot the paper out of his hand. He did, that's a fact. <laughs> and luckily the guy didn't hit his thumb. <laughs> the days drift by lazily at Gulf Hills. Elvis and June are happy together. They have all the time in the world, it seems, to be with one another. Elvis loves being with his small town girl and looks for ways to show it. One day he commissions the famous Gulf Coast artist Harry Reeks to do a portrait of each of them. And Elvis um, was not too pleased with it and said that um, it didn't do me justice. And Mr. Reeks, he was such a sweet gentleman, he said, well, it's hard to capture that much beauty. But Elvis patiently sat for this one for about a good 45 minutes. He had gotten in a, a big box of uh, souvenirs that Colonel Parker used to peddle, and he reached in and, and took out this pink scarf and draped it around my neck and pretended to be strangling me with it. With Elvis and June caught up in such simple pleasures, who would suspect Elvis Presley is on the verge of becoming the most famous entertainer in the world? He was really and truly a young boy. He had a serious side to his nature, I think he took his art seriously, but he didn't take himself seriously. 
He liked fun and he liked good times and he liked people. He just liked to rock and roll. You know, it don't take long to get sunburned out here if you're not accustomed to it. And if you're fast skinned like he was, he was sort of fast skinned. He had a, a shirt on and a life, life jacket because of that, because he had gotten sunburned. While Elvis water skis, June gets a skiing lesson. When Elvis doesn't see her watching him, he becomes irritated. He was very jealous, very possessive. He wanted me right next to him at all times. We never did really fight, never did. And if we did have an argument or a disagreement, Elvis would take me away from the, the crew of friends in some place private and apologize. The hack house, the house that he rented for the summer, had a big front lawn that was kind of like a sloping hillside with nice clean cut grass and everything. We were laying out under the stars and we had taken a, a sheet from the bed or blanket and laid it out and um, passionate kisses. And he said, I can't get married right away. I promised the Colonel I'd wait at least three years. And uh, he said, will you wait three years for me, June? And I said, sure, I'll, I'll wait. Anxious to spend more time with his parents while on vacation, Elvis drives them to New Orleans. June sits in the back with Elvis's mom. I Elvis went unrecognized. He had on a silly little hat and sunglasses. And uh, this one little uh, teenage girl tapped him on the shoulder, and he thought, oh, goodness. And he turned around, and she said, mister, will you take a picture of us? And the, the girls lined up in a line, and Elvis snapped their picture for them. Gladys says she's never seen Elvis taken with a girl as much as June. She kids Elvis that he better not let Colonel Parker know just how much. Too shy to call Mrs. Presley Gladys, June calls her Lovey, from her middle name Love. Gladys affectionately calls June Satinin. Mrs. Presley was admiring the, the houses. Mr. Presley would rather just watch where he's going than look at anything. She was saying, wouldn't that be wonderful to live in a place like that? And ended up, um, about six months later, Elvis buys Graceland that looked like one of the homes on the beach, like some of those antebellum homes. We were passing the cemetery, and she said, that's the prettiest cemetery I've ever seen in my life. Stop and, and take a ride around and go, this was the cemetery in Metairie. She told Elvis that she said she would like to be uh, not to be put in the ground, she would like to be put in a tomb like that one of these days. And he just said, it's time to go get back in the car. We're not going to talk about this. We're not even going to be here. Elvis loved his mother dearly. A lot of Southern guys are like that. When I first went on the road with Elvis, she would tell me, she would say, George, now, uh, you look after my son. Uh, and you make sure that he calls home and talks to me and, and remind him to call me every night. When he first started, it gave him tremendous pleasure to get her everything that was beautiful. He was very close and very devoted to his mother because she believed in him. It was the most tragic thing in his life when Gladys passed away. He wasn't the same after that. In the middle of his Biloxi vacation, Elvis returns to Memphis saying he has business to take care of. June wonders if it's to see Barbara Hearn, his much-publicized other girlfriend. She doesn't ask. Exhausted, June catches up on sleep. A few days later, Elvis is back, knocking on her door. Elvis spent quite a bit of time at June's mother's house there, you know. When he wasn't over at Gulf Hills, he'd be there. Well, I remember him coming here one day, and um, a lady called on the phone. And she had a little girl that had leukemia. And the little girl was crazy about Elvis. And she wanted to know if she could bring her by and, and let Elvis talk to her. And I, I asked him, and he said, sure, come, tell her to come on up. I'll be glad to see you and talk with her. 
they came on in the house and met Elvis, and he said, we don't want to be disturbed, and we don't want to be bothered with anybody, because that's mine and Carol's time. And uh, she was thrilled that he spent that much time with her, and it wasn't but about maybe a month or so that she had passed away. But she had got her wish to, you know, to be with Elvis. I had received a copy of The Prophet for a graduation gift. And I had gotten so much out of this book. When you read this, it gives you a different way to look at different things. One night when he brought me home from Gulf Hills, I should say 1 a.m., because it was usually a.m., sometimes as late as 6 a.m., when I'd finally get in. And I ran inside and, and got him a copy of my copy of The Prophet. And I said, read this. So he just took it from me without saying anything. And when he came back to my house, he had read most of the prophet. And it just, it, it brought a calm over him that was just unbelievable. And he said, I love the book. I love the book. Can I keep it? And I said, it's yours. So come to find out, uh, he kept it a copy, not necessarily my copy, but a copy of the prophet by his bedside throughout his entire life. Colonel Parker has booked Elvis on a 10-day Florida concert tour in early August. After that, Elvis is to begin filming his first motion picture, Love Me Tender, in Hollywood. Knowing that Elvis will be clear across country in just a few weeks, June begs her mother to let her go on the tour. It takes the persuading of both Elvis and Gladys Presley to convince June's mother to say yes. The night before they leave for Florida, Elvis and June stay together until morning in Elvis's bedroom at Gulf Hills. It's not for lack of desire that June stays a virgin. It's funny because things were different than they are today. You know, you had people with, you know, there, there were only a few bad girls in the whole school, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. According to June, Elvis is often the one to stop short of going all the way. In an era where premarital sex is less accepted, June believes that Elvis expects to marry a virgin. To make June less conspicuous to Colonel Parker on the Florida trip, Elvis suggests she ride with her friends Pat and Buddy, who are also invited to go along. On tour, Elvis plays back-to-back -back concerts, all filled to standing room capacity. June, Pat, and Buddy watch Elvis from the wings. It's the first time June has seen Elvis perform since the night they met. She can't help feeling jealous when she sees thousands of screaming girls competing for Elvis's attention. When June asks how he feels about the affection of so many females, he tells her, they don't love me, they love the idea of me. With the press and the colonel lurking in the hotel, June returns to her room each night. Elvis later sneaks down the hall to join her secretly. Much to Colonel Parker's irritation, the press quickly figures out that June is traveling with Elvis. The colonel did not approve of, uh, of girls in, in, in Elvis's room because he was afraid that they would do, well, that something would happen and it would be bad publicity. And I don't think it was so much that he didn't like June, he just didn't want Elvis to get involved with a lady that early in his career. He gave me some pretty dirty looks from time to time. <laughs> Colonel Parker being the snake that he was, <laughs> I just smiled. I mean, nobody really liked him, but you tolerate him, you know. He knew what he could get for Elvis. The Colonel is furious when he sees a feature article quoting June's mother saying Elvis will marry June in three years. He demands that Elvis do something immediately about the bad press. Elvis quickly concocts a story for the Miami Herald, saying he has not one, but 25 steady girlfriends. Elvis orders June to keep her mother quiet. He later apologizes, saying he feels he's losing control of his life. June wonders why Elvis won't just stand up to the Colonel, if he loves her so much. He'd come to me, I mean, even early days, and said, Colonel wants me to do this, he wants me to, I don't want so much. I said, well, tell him. You know, I said, sit down and tell him. Then tell him why you don't want to. Oh, no, I made a deal with him. He's going to take care of this, and I'll take care of the same. Elvis is also agitated about other things. He was upset because people were saying that he was uh, a child of the devil, and, you know, and he was leading our children. He just wanted people to like him. After the final show of the tour, 
June misses her ride and doesn't get back to Elvis' hotel suite for an hour. She finds him in bed in a cold sweat still dressed. He's just awoken from a nightmare. He says he dreamed he saw himself in a coffin. His mother was standing over him crying. Elvis holds June close. She fears something bad is about to happen. On August 20th, Elvis Presley begins filming his first motion picture. Elvis would go to the movie theater when he was young and he would study the actors, how they acted on the screen and what they wore and the looks that they used. He was looking forward to it. He loved movies. As much as Elvis loves the cinema, Hollywood turns out to be a different place than he expected. He misses June. He sends her telegrams and even invites her to California. He was very intimidated. He was just a small town country boy and you know, and Hollywood's a different city all on its own and everything, and uh, a lot of people telling you exactly what to do, and he was so anxious to please. And Elvis's only real problem that he had out there was he wanted it to be a straight acting part with no songs. And they, they did come up and with one song, and he, he agreed that he would sing the song, and but it wouldn't show him singing it. It was gonna be playing in the background with his voice. It would, he would not be singing it on screen. And, um, and he said, but it's a nice song. He sang it to me over the phone. And that was, uh, it used to be called Orally and they changed it to Love Me Tender. He was pleased with the song. He was not pleased, however, when they decided to make him into a little stage performer in the movie. It was just like Sinatra was. They found a niche in Hollywood, and he fit perfectly into that niche. I think the main reason that he was so upset about singing was because he hated musicals. When we went to see The King and I in Biloxi, and uh, Yul Brynner would turn to Deborah Kerr, and instead of saying, I love you, he started, would start singing, and, and Elvis would say, I can't stand it, I can't stand it, you know, let's get the hell out of here, and so we walked out on The King and I. But he hated musicals, he really did. Colonel Parker, he wasn't really artistic minded. He said, all Hollywood is interested in is making money. And my boy, he called him Elvis, my boy, said, my boy's making a lot of money. That's why we're still making these pictures. And we're not gonna change until this format runs out. Co-starring with Elvis is the beautiful starlet, Deborah Paget. Elvis thought Deborah Padgett was one of the most gorgeous ladies that he'd ever met in his entire lifetime. He had a crush on her. I think Elvis would have liked to have gone out with Deborah Padgett and captured her for his very own, but Deborah was off limits to Elvis, which I was grateful for. <laughs> uh, she was seeing someone else at the time, so it, it, never, it never materialized. Also starring in the movie is veteran actor Richard Egan. And I had just been crazy about Richard Egan. And he says, how much do you love Richard Egan? And I said, oh, about as much as you love Deborah Padgett. <laughs> Elvis is meeting lots of people in Hollywood, including Nick Adams. The pushy young actor impresses Elvis because of his supporting role in the James Dean film, Rebel Without a Cause. Nick introduces Elvis to Dean's co-star, Natalie Wood. He thought Natalie Wood was a fun girl. She was probably the hottest young female actress in Hollywood at the time, and I think he was, that was more of an infatuation with Elvis. Two weeks into the filming of Love Me Tender, Elvis makes his first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show. TV Guide marks the occasion by doing a cover story. June and her mother buy a television so they can watch. They are not alone. 82% of American households with a TV turned on that night see the broadcast. Elvis is proclaimed the king of rock and roll. When Love Me Tender wraps in mid-October, Elvis returns to Memphis, anxious to see his parents. He calls June and wires her money to fly up and stay with him. Back on Audubon Drive, June can see how much things have changed. Now large groups of fans constantly linger outside the Presley's home, hoping to meet Elvis. He attracts huge crowds, even in Memphis, where he once felt less conspicuous. Elvis and June lie in bed talking for an hour, June asks him about stories in the press detailing romances with other women. 
And when I questioned him about it, he said, don't believe anything you read in the paper. Everything you read about me is for publicity purposes. Longing for privacy, Elvis stays home. After days of feeling trapped, he and June slip out to a local Memphis theater to see newsreel footage of Elvis's Tupelo homecoming concert. When moviegoers realize Elvis is actually in the building, there is a riot. Surrounded by police, he barely escapes the theater with June close behind. Elvis tells her that for the first time, he fears for his own life. Nick Adams arrives from Los Angeles. He talks openly in front of June about Natalie Wood's interest in Elvis. In fact, his advice is that Elvis should be seen with other girls. June wonders why Elvis ever invited him. Elvis says Nick more or less invited himself. Yeah, Elvis said he was a lonely little guy. Be nice to him, June. But Nick even made a couple of passes at me. You know, and I said, you better keep your hands. If you want your hands, you better keep them to yourself. Elvis and June ride out to Mud Island to talk. It doesn't seem like the same place it once was. Elvis is clearly distracted by all the new things going on in his life. June knows he loves her, but wonders if she can ever get him back. Elvis wanted me to go and have a studio portrait made. And so I agreed to go have a studio portrait made. And when I got in there, the photographer said, uh, did you want one smiling and me and my silly wit? I said, well, I don't know, crying might be good, you know. And so we did, and uh, premonition of some sort, I don't know, for me to send Elvis a picture of me crying. Elvis entertains Natalie Wood in Memphis. June sees newspaper stories about Natalie's visit. A few days later, Elvis calls June. He tells her the colonel found out about her stay in Memphis. He says they will have to cool it for a while. I can't totally blame Colonel Parker for wrecking our relationship. Because Elvis could have said, I'm not interested, I'm not going to do it. On November the 19th, fans are going wild buying tickets to see Love Me Tender. It's June's 19th birthday. She does not hear from Elvis. Elvis is dating a Las Vegas showgirl. The girl is spending the weekend on Audubon Drive. It didn't really make me jealous. It broke my heart. Elvis didn't need me. He had worlds, you know, the whole world full of girls of his choice. But uh, no, I was not going to take a back seat to anyone. The day after Christmas, the telephone rings. Elvis is calling to say happy holidays. June asks why she hasn't heard from him. I don't know that he tried to call because I had no answer machine on my phone back then. He claims that he did try to call. June's New Year's resolution is to forget about Elvis Presley. She knows that she isn't cut out for his world. On March 18, 1957, June gets a telegram. Elvis wants her to meet him in New Orleans where he'll be changing trains. He's heading back to Memphis, about to move into Graceland. June decides to go to the station. She has something she needs to tell him. It was really hard and I just, uh, he kept saying, you gotta come home with me, I got a surprise for you. Mama can't wait to see you and you're gonna stay on the train with me. He was just ranting on and on, and I said, I can't go with you, I'm engaged to be married. But I'm telling Elvis Presley that I have met someone and I'm engaged to be married, and, and I hope it hurts him, you know? I just blurted it out, I didn't know how else to tell him. And he just looked at me. So, that's how we said goodbye. The news of Elvis's death just devastated me. And um, my husband of 20 years left work and came home to be with me because he heard on the radio. And he knew that I knew already. And he left and came home to be with me. And when he walked in the door, I'm trying to straighten up my face and put a, a cold rag on my eyes because I didn't want him to see how bad this had affected me. And uh, he just put his arms around me and he said, it's okay to cry, hon. I know how close you were to Elvis. Now, when I look back on it, it's like a different lifetime because it's, it has been so long ago. 
but I was a little stubborn, a little hard-headed, and I was not going to allow anyone to break my heart. And so it's probably a combination of me, Elvis, and Colonel Parker, <laughs> you know, that ended our relationship. But it was cherished memories.